Good morning, Woodvale. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning, whether it be online or on site, we are happy to have you. We also want to thank you for just cooperating with all the guidelines for wearing your mask and sanitizing your hands when you come in. It's so great that we get to be together this morning. So I'm asking if you just want to stand and join us for worship this morning. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? I hope you came ready to give God praise this morning. Lift up his name and worship. Amen. Come on. Oh, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, and treasures that fade are never enough. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
life. You give him praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Come on, amen. Thank you, Father. God, we praise you this morning, Lord. Praise you, Lord, for all that you are, God, all you've done for us, Lord. Coming down, Lord, and dying for us, God. Bringing us the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We exalt your name, Lord God. Thank you. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill.
We give you glory this morning, God. Father, all the praise you're worthy of. What an amazing God we serve. With everything we have, Lord, we give you praise this morning. God, from our hearts, we lift up your name. God, we invite you here this morning, Lord, to come and have your way, we pray. God, we make room for you this morning to come in and do what only you can do, God. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. I'm going to teach you guys the newer song this morning. It's called Make Room. I felt God putting this song in my heart to do for a bit now that sometimes it's hard for us to necessarily, you know, make room for God to come and do what he wants to do. And I, I felt like during this pandemic we're in, you know, being here at church together and some restrictions are here. I just felt God calling us to to make some room for him as we as we worship like this, as we come together and as we worship. And I just want to challenge all of us this morning as we're here, as we're singing this song. Open up your hearts to him. Open up your minds to him. Don't just be a spectator. The song is a bit of a prayer. I will make room for you, Lord, to come and do whatever you want to do. And God, that is our prayer this morning. We want to make room, Lord, for you to come in, Lord, right now where we're at. Whether you're watching at home, whether you're here in the building with us, wherever you're at. We want to make room for God to come and move. We need him, don't we? Church, come on. God, we want you to move, Lord, like you never have before. And God, that's our prayer. We cry out to you, Lord. We ask you to come and move in a strong way, Father. We ask for your presence, Lord. Come on, let's do this song together. Good. 
room right now, Father. Sweep across our homes. Right now we ask, Holy Spirit, we open up our hearts, our minds to you, Lord. Come and do whatever you want to do, Lord. We open ourselves up, Lord. All for you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Shake up the ground for my tradition. Break down the walls for my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better.
Come on, let's sing that bridge again. Shake up the ground. Come on. the rest of this morning, Lord, the rest of the day, the rest of our week, Lord, we want to make room, Lord, for you to come and do what only you can do, God. Break down the walls, Lord, our traditions, our religions, Lord, the things that we think are, are have to be. God, I pray you'll break those things down, God. God, we want to make more room for you. Amen, church? Come on. More room for you, Father, to come and do what you can do. Come on. Lift, lift up a shout this morning of praise. Come on. Come on, amen, amen. You guys can take a seat and take a look at the screen. Well, good morning, Woodvale, and what an amazing time of worship that was. Thank you, worship team. Well, I just want to shout out all of our first-time guests. It is so exciting to see so many first-time guests coming to Woodville in the season of COVID-19. And if you are here for the first time this morning, we are stoked that you are here. So church, let's give it up for our first-time guests. We are so pumped that you decided to join us. And if you're joining online, thank you for joining us today. We're, we're just so glad that you're here. We also want to just take this time to remind you that uh, we have options for giving. One of those options being online on our website at woodvale.ca. At the top right of the corner, you can hit the Give button and you can give there if you so please. And at the end of the service, we'll have some buckets at the back of the room if you'd like to give that way as well. We need you. We need help here at the church and we need more volunteers here to serve. And so we have a Serve 101 class coming up on November 11th that we would love you to participate in if you are able to help us in whatever capacity. More information on that can be found at woodvale.ca. I also just want to remind you that all of our shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child are due on November 15th. Be sure to get those in. We want to make sure we are a blessing. One more thing, tonight we have all church prayer at 6 p.m. If you haven't yet, make sure you register for this, but we hope you have already registered. We will see you tonight at 6 p.m. We love prayer, we love you, and we hope to see you there, six o'clock tonight. Well, that's all from me. I'm going to pass this off to Pastor Marvin as he has a missions update for us. God bless. Good morning, Woodvale. This is our special Missions Focus Sunday for this month. And it's awesome to share some incredible news with you. A couple weeks ago, we had Lynn here, global worker, who shared her story and what she's doing in the part of the world that she's been placed. Well, I want to share with you that because of that Sunday, we are able to give to her and her project $42,500. Yes, you've heard me right, $42,500. What an incredible blessing we are to her. That money puts her over the top for the project. So when she gets back, 
in a couple months, she's able to start building and renovating and making an impact in that part of the world. We have a number of global workers that we support on a monthly, regular basis. We have 25, in fact. And if you head to our website and check out Global Reach, you'll see them all listed there. You can find out where they are, who they are, and how you can pray for them. We just want to be a blessing to these global workers week in and week out. And church, continue to remember them in prayer. And we so appreciate your giving to missions on a regular basis. Bless you. Well, good morning to each and every one of you. It's great to see all of you here on site, and uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us online here in the city of Ottawa, across the nation of Canada, and around the world. It's my honor today to share with you from God's Word, and we're in a seven-part sermon series that we've called it very simply, two words, I am. We're taking seven Sundays to explore those seven great, incredible sayings of Jesus. You might remember in message number one, we talked about where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then in message number two, we talked about where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then in message number three, last Sunday, we talked about where Jesus said, I am the door. Well, today in message number four, I want to explore with you for just a few moments that great saying where Jesus said, I am am the good shepherd. And I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 10. You might remember that the first shepherd in the Bible, the first one who was entrusted with the role of a, a shepherd that's mentioned in the book of Genesis is Abel. And then you might remember that um, Abraham, he was a shepherd, and Jacob was a shepherd, and Isaac was a shepherd, and of course, David was a shepherd, the most common shepherd in the Old Testament. And sometimes when you think of a shepherd, you, you picture a shepherd holding a cuddly little sheep and just kind of, you know, enjoying baby sheep. But the truth is, to be a shepherd in those days was a lot of work. It took a lot of care, a lot of oversight. Sheep are, are dirty, and sheep are prone to wander, and sheep need to be led, and, and it's a lot of work. In fact, we learn in the Bible that God describes himself as a shepherd, and he compares us to being sheep. Now, let me fast forward and take you into first century, coming into the New Testament, because by the time you get to the first century, the, the, the role of a shepherd had lost its luster. In fact, they say that in the first century, the, the, the most common occupation, but the lowest level of occupation was a, was a shepherd. And they would be out in the fields, and, and they say that shepherds in those days were known to not tell the truth. They lied a lot, they stole, and they would, they would drop their, their gloves at a moment. They were fighting kind of people. In fact, they, they weren't even given an opportunity to be a witness in, in, in court because they were shepherds and they were known to steal and they were known to lie and they were known to fight and so it kind of lost its luster. I find it interesting and cool that Jesus redeemed the role of shepherd when he said, I am the good shepherd. And for a couple of moments today, I want to share with you seven marks or Seven characteristics that distinguishes Jesus from every other shepherd. And for each of these characteristics and for each of these marks, there's something that we can learn that can be applied to ourselves. So I want you to write this first characteristic in your notes. The first mark that distinguishes Jesus from every other shepherd, number one, is his character. His character. I want you to notice in verse number 11, and then again in verse number 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus didn't just say that he was a shepherd. He said he was not just a good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. It's almost like Jesus is in a category of his own. Now, when I think of the word good, I, I remember back in school, I mean, when you, you didn't do so well, they said you did poorly. And if you did okay, they said you did average. When you did 
pretty good. They said good. But if you really excel, do you remember the word excellent? So when I, when I read this, it almost sounds like, well, well Jesus is the good shepherd, but is there a, the excellent shepherd? Now, let me show you this. In the, in the ancient Greek language, there are several words that are used to be translated good, but the Greek word that is used here actually means excellent. It actually means noble. It actually means marked by character. It actually means that it's, it's attractive, it's, it's influential, it's, it's appealing, it's, it's motivating. It's, it's almost like what you see on the outward is a display on the inward. It speaks of integrity and character and nobility. So when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he was saying, there's no one else like me. I'm excellent. I'm noble. I, 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 what you see is who I am on the inside. And what I do is the display of who I am on the inside. It, it's a mark of, of, of a characteristic of, of him. A, an excellent, a good, a, a noble shepherd. I don't know about you, but I, I want to live a life of integrity, don't you? I want what you see is who I am. I don't want to be different on Sunday and different on Monday. I want who I am on the platform to be who I am on Monday morning. I, you see, integrity and character is who you are when no one else is looking. And I want to challenge us today, just like Jesus, when he said, I am the good shepherd, that, that we would be people of, of character. We would be people of integrity. But then there's number two. I want, to, I want to take you to the second characteristic that distinguishes Jesus from all other shepherds. Number two, his courage. And we're about to see that the courage of Jesus was, was so sacrificial. And, and, and in fact, in verse number 11, it says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then again in verse 15, and then again in verse 17, and then again in verse 18, it says the same thing. I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, you right remember last Sunday, we talked about the sheep pen. And I shared with you that a sheep pen in those days was rocks and high walls and often it was a square or a rectangle and sometimes a circle and, and it had one doorway or portal or entranceway and there was no gate that opened and there was no door that opened because we learned last Sunday that the shepherd would be the door. The shepherd would lay down in the entranceway at night and, and, and the shepherd would protect the sheep. So if a wolf or a bear or a thief or, or any kind of animal came, the, the shepherd would, would protect the sheep by lying at the door. But Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I'm told in those days, a shepherd would be willing to sacrifice his life for the sheep. And, and Jesus said, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I'm willing to sacrifice my life for you, for me, for all of mankind. I want us to not miss it today that, that Jesus gave his life so that we might live. He died so that we might live. He gave his life on a cross. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. I, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for your sins. I, I don't know about you, but I am so pumped and so glad that Jesus went to a cross for me and for you. Anybody glad today that Jesus paid the ultimate price and died for our sins? So, you know, church, when I apply that to you and me, it's like, wow, how can I compare to that sacrifice of courage? I mean, uh, give my life. I mean, he paid it all. He, he gave it all. He died so that I might live. But there are sacrifices that I can make and you can make for Jesus. We can sacrifice our time. We can sacrifice our talents. We can sacrifice our money. We can, we can say, Lord, I'm all in. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I'm yours, Lord, and I will do whatever it takes. You see, number two is courage. But then there's number three. It's the third characteristics when Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. What distinguishes him from all other shepherds? Number three, 
is his care. Now, he just gave a comparison of similarity. I am the good shepherd. But now he gives a comparison of contrast, and he compares himself to the hired hand. Now look at verse 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. I mean, the hired hand is the worker. The hired hand is, is hired. And the hired hand is doing the job for the shepherd, but, but they're hired. And they don't own the sheep, but the shepherd owns the sheep. So look, watch this. So when, when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and, and scatters it. Look at verse 13. The, the man runs away. Why? Because he's a hired hand. And he doesn't care anything for the sheep. It's kind of like, I'm just a hired hand. I'm not going to sacrifice my life for these sheep. It's not where I'm just a hired hand. They're not my sheep. I'm, if, 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 I'm, if it's going to risk my life, I'm out of here. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Because isn't there a difference between if you own the house or if you rent the house? Isn't there a difference if you own the car or if you're borrowing the car? They even say that, that adults are more likely to throw garbage out of their window than to throw garbage in their backyard. I mean, have you ever rented a car and you thought, well, it's not mine. Let me see how fast this car's going to go. Let me put the pedal to the metal. It's not mine. I'm just borrowing this car. It's no, or, or you're renting a hotel room and, and you leave it a little messy and you don't kind of take care of it the same way like it's your own because there's a difference between an owner and a renter. And a hired hand is not the owner. And the hired hand says, when, when things get rough, I'm out of here. I'm taking off. I'm not going to risk my life for these sheep. I'm going to run. And so the hired hand would actually abandon the sheep. Why? Because he doesn't care. Why? Because they're not his own. But Jesus says, I'm not like that. I will never leave you. I will never walk out on you. Anybody glad that Jesus will never walk out on you? Anybody glad that Jesus never abandons? He never forsakes. I want to be that kind of person to people. I want to be the kind of person that when everyone else walks out on their life, I want to be there with them in the good and the bad. I want my life to have the same care and concern as Jesus. But then there's number four. Number four, his, his closeness. His closeness. And I want to take you to verse 14 and verse 15. And I want you to notice the word know. K-N-O-W. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, oh yeah, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Everybody say the word no. One, two, three. No. Now, the word no in the original Greek is an interesting word. And it's not an intellectual word. It's actually a relational word. In fact, Bible scholars tell me that this relational knowledge actually speaks of, now here's, a, here's an interesting word, intimacy. Now here's the problem when I say the word intimacy. We, we start to begin to think of, of romance, intimacy. But in its original context, it's not romance, it's relational, intimacy. You might have heard of the ministry, Focus on the Family. How many people have heard of the ministry, Focus on the Family? And focus on the family talks about the ancient Greek word, which comes from the ancient Hebrew word, intimacy, which has been translated no. And they, they say it's, it's an ancient Greek word, which comes from an ancient Hebrew word, which in its root is speaking of a relationship between a husband and wife. And it's not knowledge, it's relational, it's intimacy. And, and they give a little phrase to it. Are you ready for this? In to me... C, intimacy, in to me, C. And they start to explain that it's the blending of two lives. It's the blending of hearts. 
It's the blending of two lives where the husband looks into the heart of the wife and the wife looks into the heart of the husband and looks into the depths of who they are and begins to understand who they are and begins to accept who they are and become aware of who they are and celebrate who they are. It's the blending of hearts and life into me see. And the moment that happens, you begin to feel alive. You, do, you don't feel ignored. You feel, you feel celebrated. You feel, you feel understood. And that's what the Greek word intimacy means here, which has been translated. No, no, watch this. Put it back on the screen. Verse 14. I'm the good shepherd. And Jesus said, I know my sheep. I want you to hear it today. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows you more than you know yourself. He knows your desires. He knows your needs. He knows your burdens. He knows your cares. He knows your worries. He knows your frustrations. He knows everything about you. And he gives you that invitation that you can know him. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Now look at verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. Oh, friends, what Jesus is saying here, to the same way that the Son, Jesus, has intimacy with the Father, and in the same way Heavenly Father has intimacy with the Son, you and I can have the same degree of intimacy with Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Father knows the Son, Jesus, and the Son, Jesus, knows the Father, God the Father, and Jesus knows us, and we can know him into me see. Here's the good news. He's not a distant God. Somebody say man. He's not a distant God. He's up close. And he wants to connect. And he wants a close. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. But then there's number five. What, what else distinguishes Jesus from every other shepherd? Number five is his calling. Look at verse 16. I I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Now, now a pen was a fold. And, 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 and most Bible scholars believe, what, what is Jesus referring to here? He's saying, I have other sheep than just you Jewish people. And who do they feel he's referring to? The Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jewish. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus came for everybody, whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile, whether you're white or you're black, whether you're born in Canada or born in Africa, whether you are male or whether you are female, whether you are rich or whether you are poor, Jesus came, come on, Woodville, for every single person. And Jesus said here, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Now, now it's the last words of, verse, of, 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 of the first part of verse 16 that grips my heart. I must bring them also. Don't miss the urgency. Don't miss the passion. It's like Jesus saying, I, I came for you Jewish people, but I, I came for the Gentiles as well. I've got other sheep, and I, I must, I must bring them in. You see, in the middle of a pandemic, it's kind of easy to get very focused on just us, just what we're walking through, just what we as a church are experiencing. But I pray that in the midst of this pandemic that we would not be inward focus, we would be outward focus. I'm believing that the best days for this church are the days ahead. I'm praying that you, you, as you're walking your streets, how many people are doing more walking than you've ever done before? Evelyn and I are. I'm telling you, I've walked by so many homes down so many streets, and I've met so many neighbors, and I've got a whole bunch of new friends now of people that I didn't even know live by me because everybody's going walking. How many people know those people you walk by need Jesus as well? And we've got to have an urgency to reach people for Jesus. 
He said, I've got other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. I pray that there would be a passion and a zeal in my heart and your heart to reach people for Jesus Christ. Somebody say, amen. The sixth mark or characteristic that distinguishes Jesus from every other shepherd is, is number six, his church. And I want you to notice this. He says, they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now, let me, let me for a couple moments focus on the words one flock. I mean, a flock is, is a whole bunch of groups of sheep. I mean, there's a fold, which is a pen, and then there's a flock, which is a group of sheep, which is a flock is a whole bunch of folds. And, and I guess the truth is the kingdom of God is way bigger than Woodvale Pentecostal Church. The kingdom of God is way bigger than the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. The kingdom of God is way bigger than all the believers in Ottawa. The kingdom of God is way bigger than all the believers in Canada. The kingdom of God is worldwide, and it's irrelevant of the label of denomination. What binds us in the kingdom of God, his church are those who have a believing, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Come on, can we put our hands together and celebrate the one, the one flock. It's kind of like Baskin and Robbins ice cream. How many people know that is God's ordained ice cream? And there are 31 different flavors at Baskin and Robbins. Now, I got to be honest, I don't understand the people who go to Baskin and Robbins and gets French vanilla ice cream. I mean, if you want vanilla ice cream, why are you going to Baskin and Robbins? They've got so many flavors. I, I want to tell you personally, it's just me, and you might feel the same way, but the best ice cream at Baskin and Robbins is the peanut butter and the chocolate ice cream. Any, 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 anybody else like just that one? That's the best ice cream. It's the, if you haven't tried it, try it. But it's still ice cream, whether it's French vanilla or peanut butter and chocolate or, or whatever kind that you, it's all ice cream. And I'm glad, I'm glad for my Baptist brothers. Come on. I'm glad for my brothers and sisters of other denominations in this, in this city. Come on, are you with me today, friends? I'm glad. I'm glad. So he says, one flock. But then he says one more thing here because, because it's his church. One shepherd. Now, I, I, want, I want to read to you some verses here that, that I was reading this week from 1 Peter chapter 5. It's not on the screen, but you can listen to it. And in and, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Now, I don't know if you know this, but, but the word pastor is actually better translated shepherd. That's what a pastor is. Pastor, pasture. Are you getting it? And the Greek word that's been translated pastor in the Bible is the same Greek word that's translated shepherd. So I'm a shepherd. Now watch this. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watching over them. I, I try to do that every single day. Not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. And not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. And not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. But, but, but it's verse 4 that got me. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. I just want to make it very clear today, I'm not the great shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. I am simply an under-shepherd under the great shepherd. I don't want anybody here on site or anybody watching online 
trying to get all your needs met through me because there's things that Jesus can do that no one else can do. I don't want you to be codependent on anyone. I actually want you to be codependent on Jesus Christ. I want to have a church that is filled with addicts, but addicted on Jesus. Come on, are you with me today? Addicted on Jesus. He is the great shepherd. He said there's one flock and there's one shepherd. But the final characteristic, it's a little confusing. I'm going to do my best to explain it. It's found in verse 17 and 18. Write this in your notes. His command. And I'm going to do my best to explain verse 17 and 18, which actually, to be honest with you, at first read is extremely confusing. So let's break it down. In verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Now, i got to be honest with you. When I first read that, it almost sounds like the only reason why God the Father loves God the Son is because of what God the Son did by dying on a cross for us. And that didn't sit well with me. I thought, really? The Father only loves the Son? Heavenly Father only loves the Son because of what the Son has done. So I went back to, the, to my Greek lexicon, and, and I wanted to get a better understanding of it. And wow, did it ever come to life. Let, let me give you a, a, better, a better translation of verse 17. Are you ready for this? Because or since my Father loves me, I lay down my life only to take it up again. Now, the Greek word that's used here for love is agape, unconditional love. You see, church, out of a relationship of love of the Father to the Son, out of a relationship of into me, into me see, out of a relationship of love, the Son says, it's out of the love that you have for me. I have a love for the world, and I'm going to lay down my life. Now, watch this. Only to take it up again. Now, underline the word take because it's an interesting Greek word, labo, L-A-B-O, that actually can be translated receive or take. Now, when you receive something, you've got nothing to do with it. But when you take something, it's an action on your part. And, and, and John used an interesting Greek word. Now, let's put it together. Because my Father loves me, I lay down my life only to take it up again, only to receive it again. Church, church, this is speaking of the crucifixion. And Jesus is saying here, because I have a love connection with the Father, out of relationship with the Father, I have a relationship with you. And because of that, I am going to lay down my life. And the Father's going to raise me back to life. But, but he's, I'm going to receive it, but I'm also going to be a part of this. I'm going to take it up again. Let's come to verse 18. No one takes it from me. He uses it different Greek word in verse 18 that doesn't translate receive or take, but only translate take. No one takes it from me. I mean, those Romans thought they were taking my life, but no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. It's like Jesus was saying, I willingly I freely, it was me who chose to go to a cross and die for your sins. Why? Because I'm in a love relationship with the Father. As the Father loves me, I love you, and I'm going to willingly give my life for you. Nobody else takes it. Now, now let's look at this. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And the Greek word authority means I've got the permission. It means I've got the right. I've got the power. I've got the power to lay it down. And I've got the power to take it up again. Now there's that Greek word, labo, which means take or receive. And then he says, this command I received from my father. It's a command. And I receive it from my father. Let me illustrate it. When I showed up at Woodville, one of the first things they gave me is this magic card. You know what this is? It's my access card to get into the church. I've got one. I can show up in the morning, and I can stand by that little magic little button outside, and I've 
into the building. And you know why they gave it to me? Because I'm the pastor. They're not going to give you one, but they gave me one. I've got the authority. And then they gave me a set of keys. Yes, this magic key will open up my office door. You don't have one. I've got one. I can get into my office. Now, something cool happened in my first few weeks here. They pulled Evelyn aside, and they said, Hey, Evelyn, we're going to give you an access card to the church. And because that's your husband's office, we're going to give you a key to his office as well. There's only two people who've got a key to my office, me and my wife. She's got a key to my office. And we both have an access card to get into the church. They gave us the right and the authority to enter this building. Now, I shared that illustration for, for a reason. Let's put verse 17 and 18 on the screen. I'm going to close with this. I don't want you to miss this. Because, not the reason my father loves me. Look at verse 17. Because of my father's love for me. Because of my, I laid down my life. I, I'm going to willingly go to the cross. And I'm, I'm only to take it up again. Only to receive it again. I know it's the Father who raised me to life. But because the Father and Son are one, I'm a part of me coming back to life. Look at verse 18. No one takes it from me. Those Roman soldiers thought they were in charge of my life when they took me to that cross. But they weren't in charge of my life. They were just used by the will of God to accomplish redemption. I am the one who laid down my life on my own accord. Oh, I love this. And I've got the authority. I've got the power. I've got the right to lay it down. And I've got the authority. And I've got the right to take it up again. Now, church, when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I'll, I'll tell you what it's like. In the same way, the church gave me this pass and they gave me this key. This is my access access to get in. They gave one to Evelyn. She has access to get in because she's related to me, and, and I'm connected to the church, and she's connected. You know, here it is, church. When you come to Jesus Christ, you become a child of God Almighty, and there's an authority that is given to you. There's a right that is given to you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Church, don't miss it. Verse 17 and 18 is powerful. Jesus is telling telling us that he played a part in his death and him being raised to life. And he's saying to us, we got an authority. We've got power in the name of Jesus. Now, when you become a child of God and you accept Jesus in your life, you now have got the power and the right and the authority to use the name of Jesus. If you don't get anything else this morning, get this, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. So there's, that power is, can be accessed because you're a child of God. And in these final moments, I want to tell you this. The good shepherd loves you so much. And there's things that he wants to do in your life. He wants to heal your sick body. He wants to restore your broken marriage. He wants to move that mountain that's in your life. He wants to bring freedom. He's asking you to access the authority that's found in the name of Jesus. Could you put your hands together and celebrate? Come on, put your hands together and celebrate Jesus. I want the band to come up, and I want to invite you to stand to your feet, if you would. And we're together going to worship again in a powerful song that the worship band and team led in earlier called Graves. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty pumped that the grave is empty. Amen. I'm pretty pumped that Jesus is in a class of his own. He's the good shepherd. In the same way that a shepherd would lay down their life for the sheep, Jesus said, I'm laying down my life for you. And I believe in these final moments, there's things that Jesus wants to do in this place. How many people believe nothing is impossible with God? Come on, how many people believe nothing is impossible with God? 
I want us, as we worship in this song, to pray that Jesus would step into this service and bring what is dead back to life. Amen. That he would, he would take what is broken and put it back together. Amen. That he would take what is sick and bring healing in Jesus' name. Amen. We got people in our church that are walking through disease. Can we believe this morning that Jesus would be their healer in the name of the Lord? Amen. Can we believe today that the, 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 the tumor of cancer would be broken and gone in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, we've got the authority. These are just keys to this building, but there's power in the name of Jesus. So I want you to lift your voice together and say that beautiful name, Jesus. Can we say it together? One, two, three. Jesus. Come on, let's say it again. One, two, three. Jesus. One more time. One, two, three. Jesus. You're at home and you need a miracle from God. I want you to worship with us as we here on site worship in the song. And let's believe, that this belief that the Jesus who laid down his life for us the same Jesus who was a part of him being raised to life would be the same Jesus that would step into this place and bring what is dead and bring it to life in the name of the Lord. I'll tell you why. Because he's the good shepherd. He's the, the, not a, the good shepherd. There's no one like Jesus. There's no, he's in a class of his own. He's, he's, there's no one. He's my sweet rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's my deliverer. He's my baptizer. He's my soon coming king. He's the miracle working God. He can walk on water. He can part the water. He can move the water. He can cast mountains in the sea. So I don't know what you're facing today, but he wants to take the grave and he wants to bring freedom in the name of the Lord. So from youngest to eldest, worship, lift your hands. Let's pray freedom in this place. Freedom in your home. Wherever you are, just let freedom reign. Let's, let's worship together. Oh, I've searched the world But it couldn't fail me A man's empty praise Treasures the fade Are never enough You came along Then you came along And you put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love
There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's everyone's eyes are closed in these final moments if today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity do you know beyond any shadow of doubt that you're going to heaven whether you're standing here on site or you're watching online was there a time a moment that you asked Jesus come into my life be my personal Lord and Savior you weren't always a Christian. You weren't always ready for heaven. You weren't born naturally into the family of God. There's a supernatural rebirth of you asking Jesus to come into your life. If you're standing here today or you're watching online and you've never asked Christ to be the center of your life, I want to lead you in this prayer of receiving Jesus. And we're going to join you as you pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. I ask you into my life. Please forgive, me of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. I have decided, I've decided to follow Jesus. follow Jesus. I make my peace with you today. I, make my peace with I receive you in my life. I you in my in life. Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Open your eyes and celebrate for a moment salvation. Now, if you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you made the best decision of your life. You're here on site and you prayed that prayer. On your way out, you'll see some tables. We've got a Bible for you, a little booklet for you. And we can tell you how we can help you in your new faith journey. And if you don't attend regularly a life-giving, Bible-believing church, we'd be honored if you join us in the journey. If you're watching online, you will see platforms that you can reach out to, and we will reach back to you, and we're going to help you in your new faith journey. Well, I want us one more time to thank all of our guests for joining us today on site or online. Can we just thank everyone? And if you're here on site and you're our guest, thank you for coming. Drop by a table on the way out. We have a coffee card for you, our way of saying thank you for coming. I hope you can come to prayer tonight, 6 o'clock to 7. And uh, we had our first on-site prayer gathering a month ago. It was great. And we encourage you to come. You need to register online. Come as a family. It's family friendly. And it's a power-packed hour of just a bit of worship and prayer. You will not be disappointed. And uh, if you've come here this morning and you'd like someone to pray for you, I want our altar workers to come and make themselves ready at the front. And after the service, you can come to the front and we would love to pray for you. But Father, thank you for our time this morning. Bless everyone we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.